afternoon. Can we all get seated? We're going to start. Good welcome. Uh, uh, we're very happy. I'm the uh, Albert Park, the director of the ISTOC Institute for Emerging Park Studies. Um, and uh, we're very happy to co-organize this event with the World Bank uh, to launch a new report on East Asia called A Resurgent East Asia Navigating a Changing World. And we're very fortunate to have both of the authors of this report uh, here with us to present the main findings. Um, and uh, they are uh, Sudhir Shetty, who's the chief economist for East Asia and Pacific at the bank, and Andrew Mason, who is the lead economist for the Office of the Chief Economist of uh, the World Bank. And uh, following their presentation, uh, we'll uh, have two uh, sets of discussing comments, one from Dayang Xie, who's a professor of economics at HKUST, and myself. Um, I'm also an economist, um, as are, I think, Sudhir and Andy, so it's going to be a lot of economics, I guess, um, today. Um, and then we'll open uh, the floor up to questions, and we'll try to end around 2 p.m. So without further ado, let me uh, invite Sudhir and Andy. They're going to split the presentation. I think Sudhir's going to start, and then Andy's going to come on, and then Sudhir's going to finish up. So welcome. Thank you very much uh, Robert, for that uh, introduction and uh, we'll just click on the Okay, and uh, thank you again to you, uh, Albert, and to the HKUST for hosting this. Thank you all for your interest in this. Uh, as Albert said, we just launched this report, the research in East Asia. Sorry, I need to speak into it. I have a tendency to wander. Okay, I think this is better. Okay, so. Um, uh, as Albert said, uh, this is a report we just launched uh, at the World Bank, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, presenting it in uh, Hong Kong. And as he said, we'll, uh, Andy and I will do the take turns in doing this and presenting the main messages. Uh, this is what the overview looks like. The, uh, overall, the larger report is also on the web. We try to write not too long a report, so it's under 200 pages, which for the World Bank is uh, remarkable, uh, we think. Uh, but as I think uh, a WAG once put it, it took us longer to write the shorter reports. So anyway, um, but before, let me just do two things before I turn it over to Andy. And uh, the first will be to put this report in a bit of perspective so you have a sense of what we're talking about. So when we at the World Bank talk about East Asia, we recognize that there is uh, 
developed East Asia, uh, which is uh, Japan, Singapore, etc. But there's also developing East Asia. And this is a report about developing East Asia. And in particular, it is a, it's a report about the 10 countries of developing East Asia, which range from Mongolia through, of course, to China. And they account for about 90% of the population of uh, East Asia as a whole. The second is, this is a medium-term report. So this is not a report that's trying to look at what is growth likely to be in 2020 in China. That's an interesting question. It's a question that dominates the airwaves. Uh, but it's not the question this report is trying to look at. And finally, this is a report that is not, by design, is not meant to be uh, to cover the entire waterfront. We are not looking at all of the challenges that developing East Asia faces. We're looking at some very particular challenges that developing East Asia faces. And in particular, we're looking at challenges that developing East Asia faces in moving to the next level. So we are asking the question, now that developing East Asia, now that all 10 of these countries are middle income countries, what are the challenges they, they're likely to face in moving to high income? This is, we've heard, you know, in the last few years, we've heard a lot about the so-called middle income trap. One of the problems with the middle income trap is that it can mean anything to anyone. And so we're trying to put a little bit of flesh on that, on those bones, and say, can we think about some very specific aspects of the so-called middle income trap that might apply to East Asia, to developing East Asia, at this juncture? And therefore, one of the things we are particularly interested in is how is the world changing? Uh, and how might that affect the countries of developing East Asia as they try to make the transition from middle income uh, to high income? So with that, uh, you know, let me just quickly summarize the key messages. And as I said, I will pick up on some of these, and Andy will pick up on some others. The first is to recognize how successful East Asia has been. This truly is the development success story of our generation. And you can see this in many ways. One is that GDP in these 10 countries of developing East Asia has tripled in real terms in the last quarter century. You can see it in other ways. You can see it in the fact that a billion people in this region have been moved out of extreme poverty into either what we call uh, uh, economic security, a large enough proportion of them into what we call economic security, or even the middle class. I mean, these are things you're all aware of because you live in the region, but it's worth pointing these out because the world would be a very different place if the rest of the world had been able to achieve what developing East Asia has achieved. However, and this is our transition to the, to the rest of this report, this resurgence of developing East Asia is not yet complete. And it's not yet complete. You can see this in many respects. You can see it in terms of income levels. So everyone, including in the United States, where I, Andy, and I live, seems to think of China as being a developed country. It is not. Its per capita income is a fifth of the average of high-income countries. Vietnam is 5% of the average of high-income countries. Cambodia is 3% of the average of high-income. So the resurgence, you know, it's, it's not yet, these are not, this is very much a region of developing countries. You can see it in terms of productivity levels. So if you look at what China's labor productivity levels are today, and you compare it to what Korea's were, when Korea became a high-income economy uh, around 2000, it's, Korea's uh, labor productivity levels are about two and a half times higher than that in China. So, so in many respects, the resurgence is, is not complete. And to complicate this, and this is very much the theme of this report, the world is changing. And, and what we do here is we pick up on three aspects of this. One, we pick up on the fact that global trade is slow. And this is not just because of the protectionism that one is seeing. It was, it's a longer term phenomenon. You saw it coming out of the global financial crisis. So global trade is slowing. And this is of particular concern to this region, because this is the most outward oriented of regions. This is a region whose success has been based on openness, on, on tapping into export markets and, and, uh, and, and uh, developing on the basis of Second, the, the second challenge is one of technological change. And again, 
we, you know, we constantly hear of Industry 4.0, Industry 5.0. There are concerns about whether the robots will be taking jobs. There are concerns about uh, uh, skill premium rising. So it's all of those concerns that, that provide a second set of challenges. And a third set of challenges is that as countries are getting more prosperous in this region as well as elsewhere, the demands on state institutions are increasing. It's no longer enough to be able to say, well, the government is very good at providing basic education. Well, guess what? You need to do more. There are, there are people, there are more middle class people, they are more sophisticated in their demands on, on government institutions. And so those are the three sets of challenges that we focus on uh, in this report. And, and, and we then try to draw out the implications for policy. What should the, these countries do if they are to continue their development trajectory, if they are to successfully make this transition from middle income uh, to high income? So very quickly, in a, in a couple of minutes now, let me uh, <coughs> just quickly summarize. So what do we mean by the East Asian Development Model? And in very broad brush terms, if you're all familiar with this, we, we highlight three aspects. One, this reliance on outward orientation, which in most of these countries translated into labor-intensive growth. They were able to not only grow rapidly, but also provide jobs in, in large numbers and at a rapid pace to their populations. Second, an emphasis on basic human capital development, on basic education, on health, in many countries on uh, uh, family planning. And finally, an emphasis on sound economic governance. And I want to emphasize the point about economic governance. This was about macro stability, it was about a focus on implementation. It was on having uh, a small, uh, efficient cadre of civil of uh, civil servants who were able to uh, uh, formulate development policies and uh, implement. And as I said before, the 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 um, results were sorry, were clear. Uh, you, you see this in this picture. You look at developing East Asia on the left-hand side there, and you look at developing East Asia <coughs> excluding China, because obviously China dominates the picture, so it's worth looking at developing East Asia without China. And you see how well East Asia has done in terms of growth, uh, both from in the 1990s, as well as following the Asian financial crisis in the, uh, from, from the year 2000, relative to the other developing regions in the world. So you look at uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, for instance. You look at uh, 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 the Middle East and North Africa. You look, look at Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, uh, East Asia stands up. You see this also in terms of the results on, on uh, poverty that I mentioned, the, the rapid pace of poverty reduction. So those, those dark blue uh, shades there refer to extreme poverty, and you see how that was, of the, at the, in the early 2000s, was accounted for uh, over half the population across this region. And now accounts for about 10% or thereabouts of the, of the population. And correspondingly, the green and the, and the yellow, which are the economically uh, secure and the middle class uh, populations, uh, the, that, that share has risen to almost two thirds of the population in this region. Finally, on the point about sound economic governance, you see that reflected in this ranking from the World Governance Indicate, Worldwide Governance Indicators. Uh, at the big, at, in the middle 90s, East Asia, developing East Asia lagged the average for lower middle income and upper middle income countries. Its percentile ranking has gone up and is now, now exceeds the average for upper middle income countries. So this is the 10 countries of developing East Asia. And, and this is a measure, as I said before, of policy formulate, of the effectiveness of policy formulation, of policy implementation, uh, and the like. So now let me turn it over to, Anne, uh, to uh, my co-author, Andrew Mason, who will take us through the next section. Thanks, Adir. Thank you, everybody, for coming. So um, Sudhir has already set this up a bit, uh, and, and, and a lot of the report really focuses on uh, the impact of changing times and the changing 
challenges as associated with that. So he mentioned briefly, but we focus a lot on a slowing growth of global trade. Uh, the growth of, East, of developing East Asia has really been built on export-oriented export manufacturing, as Sudhir said. So this has impl implications for thinking about the future. Technology is changing very rapidly, so that's another piece of the puzzle. And the countries themselves are, are, are changing. So there are concerns within countries, for example, about rising inequality. Actually, the data show that in some countries uh, we, can, we can measure that inequality is rising, and in others that we, uh, we can't. But even where we can't measure uh, quantitatively rising inequality, we see that uh, members of society feel that uh, things are getting worse in terms of equality of opportunity. That maybe the, the forces that lifted all boats or many boats in the past are no longer there to be lifting them in the future. And there may be, uh, may be growing schism within society. And finally, as Sudhir said, that as countries are becoming uh, more affluent, then citizens in these countries' expectations uh, are rising in terms about uh, what their governments will deliver uh, with respect to the quantity and quality of services. So within that context, the report focuses on really three key challenges. Slowing productivity growth. Now, uh, I should say this is not just an issue of uh, developing East Asia since the global financial crisis. Productivity growth has been slowing worldwide, but developing East Asian countries are not immune to uh, this challenge. Inclusion at risk. So this is the story that maybe what worked well in the future to, ri to raise many or all boats <coughs> in society will not work the same way in the face of uh, global and uh, domestic changes. And finally, rising demands on state institutions. And here there, there are really three elements to this. The first element is simply that as countries become higher income, the challenges associated with policy and new generations of policy reform uh, become more complex and, and more sophisticated. The first generation reforms that you did uh, were less, were important of course, but, but less uh, sophisticated, less complex perhaps than the next generation reports to, uh, reforms to move uh, the economy forward. Second, middle income countries experience an evolving political economy for reform, which makes f making future reforms harder than in the past. What do I mean by that? Well, the first set of reforms that got growth going in the first place created a set of winners uh, in, in society in, and in the economy. Could be in the private sector, could be in the public sector, including state-owned enterprises in, in, in some countries. But now these interests in many countries have become entrenched. Uh, and, and they may resist exactly the sorts of economic reforms that are needed to propel uh, countries into the next stage of development. And finally, in the face of rising societal expectations, there are rising demands on state institutions, both to provide more but also better quality services. So let me uh, unpack. Uh, let me unpack these for you a bit uh, in some of the data and analysis that we've done uh, uh, and we present in the report. Starting with uh, challenges to productivity growth. So here in this slide, uh, this shows that uh, over the last 10 to 15 years or so, that there's been slowing growth in trade particularly trade in goods. And um, let's see if I can get, ah, good. So trade in goods is this black line here. And what you can see is that from the time of the financial, global financial crisis, there was a drop, then rising, and pretty much in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, there's been a stagnation in growth uh, of, of goods globally. Now, it's interesting to note as well that uh, there's also been a slowdown in growth of services, but growth in services has actually grown much more robustly. And we expect that growth in services will grow most, more robustly than, than growth, in goods, uh, uh, good, uh, growth in trade in goods in the future. Now, there are a number of reasons for this, but one of the really important uh, reasons Sudhir kind of highlighted, which is that the, the rising role of services embedded in manufactured goods. 
So uh, just to give you uh, exhibit A, my iPhone. The iPhone itself, of course, is a good. But why do we value and love our iPhones? Because of the services embedded in it, the apps, uh, the computing power, uh, and so on. So that's one dimension of what's sometimes called the servicification uh, of manufacturing. The other thing is that in the front end and on the back end, design, marketing, and so on are all related to services. So, uh, so, so services trade, we believe, is going to be increasingly important in the future. Now, why am I, why am I focusing on this? Because another challenge uh, that uh, developing East Asian countries face, in addition to slowing growth in goods trade, is the fact that uh, the developing countries in this region are, are not yet very well positioned to take advantage of, of growing uh, growth in, in, in trade and services. So this graph shows on the x-axis uh, average tariff levels. And if uh, the countries that are on the left side of uh, the vertical line those are countries that have done very well in liberalizing <coughs> goods trade. And then the y-axis uh, is uh, a, an index of service uh, trade restrictions. And if you're above the vertical line, uh, sorry, above the horizontal line, it means that you've done less well than the global average in liberalizing uh, trade and services. And what you can see from this red circle is that the lion's share of countries in this region, while they've done very well in liberalizing goods trade, still have very far to go and do worse than average uh, in uh, the liberalization or, uh, or opening up of, of services trade. So this, this also then represents a, a future challenge uh, for policy and, and for uh, productivity growth. In addition to the trade story, uh, innovation is going to be a very important piece of the puzzle for spurring productivity growth going forward. So in the report, we analyze product, uh, 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 innovation and what we call the innovation ecosystem. Um, often, uh, people think that innovation is really a function of research and development. Well, of course, research and development is important. Actually, there's a much broader set of policies and institutions <coughs> that help enable or impede uh, innovation. This chart uh, comes from data from the Global Innovation Index, and it shows five categories of what we call innovation inputs. In, uh, institutions, first column, that really means um, the business climate and the regulatory environment. Human capital, that's really learning and human capacity to, to generate and utilize uh, new technologies. Infrastructure, market sophistication, and business sophistication. It will not surprise you that the red uh, on this uh, figure means bad and the green means good. So red for each of these areas and for these countries means where the country is below the global average and below where you would expect them to be in each of these uh, key areas of innovation inputs. What you can see is that institutions in particular is an area of big, of big challenges. Uh, all but one country, Malaysia, falls uh, below where they'd be expected to be. Uh, uh, at this stage of development, but also human capital and business sophistication represent important challenges going forward. So if innovation is going to help spur productivity growth uh, in the future, then there are multiple challenges that countries in this region need to face. Technology. Now, in many ways, we look to technology as, as really an opportunity to uh, enhance productivity growth into the future, and, 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 and I think that that uh, is absolutely correct. Here uh, is a graph that shows uh, industrial, the number of industrial robots and the, what's sometimes called the robot density uh, in countries uh, both in developed and developing East Asia. And in fact, in China, China is uh, building up its stock of industrial robots faster than perhaps uh, any, other, any other country. But with rising technology, uh, there are a number of challenges for, uh, for developing East Asia that put at risk the inclusivity of growth. This, is our, this was the second challenge that uh, we, we focused on in the, in the report. So let me illustrate for you some of the challenges uh, uh, and why we worry about uh, uh, inclusion at risk going forward, in part as a result of rising technologies. This graph shows data from six countries 
in the region by socioeconomic category from poor all the way to the middle class. And what you can see is that there are uh, important differences in access to internet across, uh, uh, both across but certainly within countries. Simply stated, while in, in these countries the middle class may have pretty good access to internet, in many of these countries uh, the poor have very little or almost no access. So if, uh, if poor and, and economically vulnerable people don't have access to the technology that's going to propel developing East Asia into the future, then their, then their ability to participate in the 21st century economy will be at risk. Second, we see in the data that there's rising demand for skills in the labor market over time. I should uh, be, say that this is partly a function of tech, uh, technology, but it's partially also a function of other things like structural transformation uh, in, in societies. But if you look, we took a couple of uh, examples from, from the report of Malaysia, an upper income country, and Vietnam, a, a lower income country. What you can see is that the rising blue and black bars show rising demand, rising skills content of jobs over time for what we call non-routine analytical and non-routine interpersonal skills. And the lines going down are, uh, are really routine and especially manual tasks. So even before, you know, we're, we're in the process of technology adoption, but even before we see the full-fledged effects of technolo technological change, we see that uh, there's demand growing for more advanced skills uh, and less for manual skills. So to the extent that uh, you don't have those advanced skills, there's a risk uh, that you can, again, fall behind as uh, societies advance. I, I do want to highlight that, uh, that uh, some analysis was done here by uh, Professor Park and a, and a co-author, very similar approach to, what I, uh, to the graph I just showed you, but for China, using census and, uh, and intersensal data. Um, we see a slightly different pattern, especially from uh, 2000 to 2010. Professor Park may wish to comment on this, I don't know. But basically, what you see here that's different is that, uh, that non-routine manual tasks, as well as routine cognitive tasks, are increasing uh, in intensity over, over the period. Uh, the, the paper focuses on the role of growing retail and, and related services in China as driving those sorts of changes. But what you can see is that actually from 2010 to 2015, if you just take those last five years of the data, the patterns actually look quite similar to what I was showing you uh, in the previous graph. Okay, another reason why um, inclusion may be at risk, uh, besides ac access to technology and, uh, and skills, is that there's, uh, there's a systematic difference in learning outcomes between poor and non-poor uh, in developing East Asian countries. So, so poor people face a double challenge in, in these countries. First, poor actually generally have less access to education than non-poor, especially at the secondary and tertiary, uh, tertiary levels. But what this graph shows is that even when poor people have access to education, they're getting a lower quality education. So, so, the, so their ability to compete in the 21st uh, century economy uh, may be lower than their wealthier counterparts. Finally, on the issue of inclusion, one thing that we see in the data is that countries in developing East Asia spend relatively little on the social sectors, meaning education, health, and social protection. And um, there's a number of reason, reasons why this is important, but one key reason why it's important in the context of inclusive growth is that in a rapidly changing economic environment where people undergo uh, regular job transitions, there's a chance that when people fall uh, through the cracks, they become unemployed, they have some time between jobs, or maybe they can't compete. These countries are spending very little money in the sorts of program safety nets and uh, jobs and training programs that help people who have trouble making the transition get back onto their feet. So let me turn uh, in a few minutes on the uh, governance and challenges to uh, on the demands of state institutions. Sudhir showed a a figure uh, that showed that uh, government effectiveness in developing East Asian countries was good and on the rise. Uh, 
This is a measure, global, uh, a measure uh, in global, globally collected data on voice and accountability. Uh, developing East Asia is again the black line, and you can see in comparison to low and middle income countries around the world, uh, developing East Asia does uh, relatively poorly, and we have not seen improvements uh, over the last 20 year period as well. In addition, we see that um, there are relatively fewer constraints on executive decision making uh, in uh, developing East Asian countries. It's been improving over time, but not yet at the level of uh, upper middle income countries around the world. So when I talk about constraints on executive decision making, what I mean are things like um, an independent uh, legislature, an independent judiciary, uh, 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 an active uh, civil society, uh, an, uh, an independent media, things that are very important for dealing with this issue of policy capture that I, that I mentioned earlier. Um, a way to sort of help break entrenched interests. So, so some challenges here as well as in the general area of, of voice and accountability. Moreover, uh, countries in developing East Asia face challenges with respect to a strong, vibrant, and effective civil servants, civil service. We have two graphs here: the one on the right hand, uh, the one on, sorry, on your left hand side, uh, is focuses on the selection and criteria for for hiring of civil service. The blue dots are developing East Asia, and what we see actually is that, in terms of hiring that the selection criteria in terms of merit, in terms of comp uh, com competitive selection, is pretty good in most of the countries in this region. But what this panel on the, on the right-hand side shows is that while there's good criteria, that um, selection of civil service on the basis of merit is still very much tempered by family connections and by political connections in this region. And that's this cluster of blue dots in this upper right-hand side. Finally, uh, Sudhir started the presentation by saying that this report really looks at the aspirations of developing East Asian countries moving from middle to, to high income levels. Uh, now, one feature of, 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 of uh, reaching high income levels is actually governments that can prov provide the sorts of services, quantity, and quality that are demanded by their citizens. And that requires resources. So we looked at uh, government revenues, government revenue intake. That's the power to, uh, to uh, commission and purchase and uh, deliver services. What we see is that the lion's share of countries in developing East Asia uh, actually fall at the very bottom end compared to middle and, and high income countries. This doesn't, just so we're clear, this doesn't include low income countries, but it includes selection of similar and countries to which developing East Asian uh, societies would aspire. I should mention it's, it's uh, not at the very bottom. China is here, about 24% of GDP collected in, in revenue. So among the 10 countries we study, uh, with the exception of Mongolia, it's the highest. But as you can see, most of the countries in developing East Asia uh, are on the far left of this graph, creating yet another challenge for the future for moving from middle to high income. So that was a, 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 rapid, uh, a rapid run through uh, some of the key issues and challenges uh, faced uh, by developing East Asian countries as they move from, try to move from middle to high income. And with that, let me turn back to Sudhir to tell us what this implies for policy. Thank you. Uh, so in the, in the next uh, seven or eight minutes, let me just quickly tell you what we think this implies for policy as these countries. I hate to use the middle income trap, but it's such a convenient device. So what do they need to do to escape the quote-unquote middle income trap, at least the one the way we've characterized it? And uh, I mean, essentially, uh, our bottom line is that there's a lot that's still good in the development model that these countries adopted that got them to where they are. So the good news is it's not time for a total rethinking of the development model. You don't have to throw everything out. 
there's lots of uh, uh, potential yet in this outward-oriented growth model that emphasized human capital development and sound economic governance. However, the challenges we focus on here, the challenges of slowing productivity growth, the challenge of uh, inclusion being continued as, they, as these countries progress, and this challenge of rising demands on state institutions will require changes around this model, uh, particularly in light of the other changes that we talked about, slowing global trade, uh, 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 technological change, and flagging state effectiveness, which were highlighted by Andy in the previous section. So they need to adapt elements of their approach. So how, how will they need to adapt it? And we uh, talk about this in five buckets. And, under, and importantly, in each of these buckets, what we do is we talk about a traditional agenda, an agenda that many of these countries are already pursuing, which they'll need to continue to pursue. But in addition, and this is where the tweaking will occur, they will need to emphasize or bring to the fore new aspects of policy. And these are the five buckets. Let me take them each in turn. Boosting economic competitiveness. Now, the traditional agenda here is one of improving the business climate. It remains important. You know, for every Malaysia that's in the top 20 in doing business, there's an Indonesia, there's a, a Myanmar, there's a Laos and a Cambodia, which are in the hundreds in terms of doing business. Now, you may hate the doing business index, but pick your own index. What these point to is that there are real issues around the business climate in these countries. So there is, and this is a traditional agenda, this is an agenda they need to continue to pursue, reforming regulations, making, uh, making it easier for the private sector to operate. Strengthening the financial sector infrastructure is another example. While many of these countries have done well following the, global financial, uh, following the Asian financial crisis in terms of deepening capital markets, access to capital, particularly for small and medium enterprises, and we highlight this and, sh and, and demonstrated in the report, remains very much a work in progress. So there's still work to be done. But having said this, there are new emerging policy priorities. And the services sector, building on the point that Andy made about how restrictive the services sectors in these economies still are. And, and it poses a real problem. Because as we've seen, one of the aspects of technological change that's particular, that is you know, that is included in this thing about Industry 4.0 and Industry 5.0 is this blurring between services and manufacturing. Uh, as the iPhone so clearly illustrates, it's very hard to draw the line anymore between this is a manufactured product and these are the services that go into manufacturing. And, and yet yeah, what you have is our relatively inefficient <coughs> service sectors in these economies. And there's a lot of evidence from countries like Indonesia, which we highlight in the report, that shows what a big impact liberalizing service sectors can have on TFP growth in manufacturing, because manufacturing is so dependent on service. And in this context, trade agreements can be a particularly powerful way of, of getting this reform through. And this is one of the good things about the fact that TPP survived the departure of uh, the United States. The fact that the other countries that were part of TPP decided to take it out and, and rename it but continue on many of the, the, the aspects of trade reform that were embodied uh, in the original TPP. Uh, we spoke earlier about the need to think of innovation policies more broadly. It's not just about R&D. It's about the supply side of, the, of, of innovation. It's about firm capabilities. There's, there's, uh, and in e many of these areas, as you saw from the diagnostic that was presented earlier, much of developing East Asia does good. And finally, I mentioned the point about SME access to finance. So, so this is one bucket of, of uh, uh, areas where uh, reforms are needed, both in traditional areas as well as in new areas. Building skills. This is a function quite clearly of, of the pace of technological change. The fact that, yes, while this region did very well in building basic human capital, the world is changing very rapidly. There's a need to keep up with the changes in the world, to keep up with changes in technology, to provide your citizens with these new skills that this new economy will require. And uh, again, there's a, there's a 
traditional set of policies here, foundational policies, in many countries, many of these upper middle income economies in this region, Thailand, Malaysia in particular, uh, the quality of basic schooling is still very poor. So they did very well in getting kids into school. They're not doing so well in teaching those kids anything about anything. Uh, and therefore, there's a need to strengthen learning outcomes. There's a need uh, in, in many countries, including in a country as successful as Vietnam, to universalize primary and secondary education. There are excluded groups in these countries uh, that still don't remain in school. Uh, finally, uh, there's a need to broaden access to make sure that more kids make it to universities. But in, on top of this, because of this pace of technological change, there's a need to do things like emphasize uh, a broader skill set. It's not just about working in factories, it's about cognitive and social emotional skills, many of which will require a greater investment in uh, early childhood education, in starting at the very beginning of, of life and then carrying it through. There's a need for to ensure that skills, people's skills can evolve, can develop as they continue to be in the workforce. And because so much of this new technology is dependent on digital uh, technology, uh, is, is linked to, di to, to digitization, there's a need to ensure that people's digital and technical capabilities keep up with that. Third, uh, on fostering inclusion, uh, this again is related to the pace of technological change. The fact that people can no longer uh, be like me and assume that they can keep one job for much of their working lives. That's going to be not the norm. That's going to be the exception. And therefore, there will be a need for countries to focus on things, uh, on some of those emerging policy priorities I meant that are listed at the top. But before that, we sh there's also a need to look at some of the traditional areas. The pattern of public spending in many of these countries is still very skewed towards generalized subsidies. Indonesia, despite all of its efforts to reform fuel subsidies, for instance, remains a country where too much of its subsidies are provided in a generalized fashion. There's a need to expand targeted social assistance that focuses on those who are really poor, as opposed to a broader group of the population. And more broadly, there's a need to reorient public spending. But on top of that, coming to these, to these emerging areas, there's a need to recognize that people's Jobs are, job security is going to be reduced, and therefore that will have implications for employment support services, for the way in which unemployment benefits are uh, designed, and again, crucially, ensuring that people have access uh, to digital technologies, because that really is going to be their ladder to new opportunities. Uh, turning to state institutions, we saw that the challenge here is one of rising demands on these institutions, in a, in a context in which state effectiveness has been flagged. And so the, the, the important foundational piece here that countries are already engaged in is that they need to continue to strengthen bureaucratic quality. And in this regard, uh, some of the diagnostic we offered in terms of how hirings and promotions are done, how performance is managed in the civil service are important, and that will continue to be important. But in addition, there's a need to recognize that being at middle income is going to impose greater demands on these state institutions. So there's a need to promote voice and participation. There's a need to increase the transparency of government. And very importantly, there's a need to strengthen the system of checks and balances. We saw how, how East Asia lags, developing East Asia lags in this regard in terms of uh, uh, the, it's the relative ineffectiveness of checks and balances on executive authority. Finally, getting to high income means having resources to provide services that your increasingly middle class populations demand. This is going to require fundamentally that you expand your tax base. Uh, even middle income countries in this region, like Indonesia uh, or the Philippines, raise 15 to 16 percent of their GDP in revenue. It's going to be very hard to transition to high income on the, on the basis of that kind of revenue collection. So foundationally, they need to continue to do things they're doing on tax administration, on simplification of tax codes. But there will be a need to go even further 
to try to expand the tax base by thinking of new taxes uh, such as the ones we've listed there, including, importantly, property taxes and wealth taxes, but also taxes on negative externalities uh, uh, such as uh, pollution and congestion. And there's also a need to reduce tax competition. This is an important agenda item, has been an important agenda item for ASEAN, uh, where, so that there isn't, in a sense, uh, uh, competition to the lowest denominator where everyone is trying to attract foreign investment and in the process reducing their tax, uh, narrowing their tax base. So, so very quickly, in conclusion, uh, I think this is, these are the key messages of this, of this study. One, the East Asian Development Model, great success uh, on any dimension you want to think about, whether you think of income growth, whether you think of poverty reduction, whether you think of economic security. However, complacency would be the wrong thing for policymakers. This is not the time to sit back and say, oh, we're still growing at 6% in a world in which 6% is something that our counterparts in Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa would uh, 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 give their last dollars for. But rather, it requires the rethinking of some aspects and a, and a reformulation of some aspects of development policy to address these emerging challenges in the context of the changes that are occurring both in the world as well as in the countries. Now, we don't know the pace and the nature. We don't know how quickly technology is going to be adopted. We don't know how quickly robots are going to take over manufacturing processes. We don't know exactly at what pace manufacturing is going to shift out of China into some of the lower income East Asian countries that surround it. But we do know the direction in which it's going. And that's what policymakers will need to, uh, in this region, will need to uh, act on. And they need to act on it quickly and decisively. If we are going to be back here 25 years from now and look at this set of 10 East Asian uh, developing economies with perhaps half of them having graduated successfully to high income status. Thank you very much. All right, um, let me first uh, congratulate uh, Sudhir and Andy for a very well written report, very timely. And um, you know, it contains a wealth of information highlighting the uh, uh, you know, relative strengths and weaknesses of uh, developing East Asia. Okay. And more importantly, um, I think the report provides a framework for us to think about the development issues in East Asia. Okay. So first, uh, let me just try to summarize uh, a little bit, or recap. Um, so they pointed out that there are three pillars for the successful development model, which is uh, you know, East Asian growth with equity okay, development model. These three pillars are outward orientation, right, um, and investment uh, in you know, basic human capital, uh, plus sound economic governance. And then, of course, we are uh, in a tough time. Okay, the, there are so many things which are changing uh, in the world. So they talked about the changing times and the rising challenges. Uh, the productivity slowed down, you know, the need uh, to further open up trading services, okay. um, and also you know, the state effectiveness uh, needs to be further improved. Okay, so that's uh, uh, just a very brief summary of uh, you know, what they write about. Now, my discussion would be just using China as a case study. 
Um, you know, last year it was uh, a celebration of uh, China's 40 years of reform and opening up. Okay. Uh, there were many occasions, uh, you know, for celebrations, and I was invited to, uh, you know, give some speech on the subject. Um, so what I did was to discuss you know, China's measures, and I sep separate the measures into the measures that advance the production possibility frontier, okay, and the measures that move the economy closer to the production possibility frontier. Okay. Of course, I mean, the past 40 years have been a great success, uh, a success in many regards, but also it accumulated some problems. Right? So that's something uh, that I want to talk about, you know, the changing times and rising challenges. Okay. But first, let me just uh, give you the, uh, the different measures um, that uh, I want to highlight. Okay. So this is the production possibility frontier. And the blue ones were the uh, production possibility frontier for the advanced economies. Okay. So here, West means advanced economies. <coughs> and then the red one is for China. Okay. So you see that the blue one uh, goes outward you know, by uh, a small amount, okay? But China uh, pushed outside uh, very quickly for the first uh, 20 years of reform. So the measures that I want to highlight, uh, um, well, first of all, emancipate the mind. I think that, you know, no matter how much you emphasize, it's not too much, okay? So we should strongly emphasize that this was uh, an important measure, emancipate the mind. So basically, you know, before the reform, so many things that you know, people were worried that can be done. Okay? Uh, they could not even dare to think about. Um, but after the reform, uh, things that have not been done before, you can try. Okay? Things not, that have not been forbidden, you, know, you can try. Even things that, are, that were forbidden, you can still try, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, the importance of that, uh, uh, <coughs> it's just so important, okay? And then, uh, uh, since I came from the background of endogenous economic growth, you know, that, that highlights um, standing on the shoulder of the giant, you know, borrowing ideas, uh, importing ideas, uh, learn from uh, the successful models, etc. So. So those were uh, some other measures that I want to talk, talk about. Uh, but I will not go through every item. I will have a chance to talk more later. Okay? Uh, so the next 20 years, uh, again, there is a um, big outside move for China. Okay? Um, continuation of this uh, emancipation of the mind and uh, you know, import um, ideas uh, borrow business models from overseas, etc. Okay, now what about the economic, actual economic performance? That is, uh, moving from the, uh, you know, inside production possibility frontier, okay, to closer uh, to the frontier. Okay. Um, so that would occur if you can improve efficiency. Right? So here you see items such as uh, reform on the incentive mechanism, okay, and the market reform. You know, market reform is not a straightforward reform. You know, when you go from a planned economy to to a market, you know, to term market-oriented economy, uh, sometimes it can be a, a chaos. Okay, so as uh, hap what had happened uh, in 1989 uh, and in 1994. Okay, um, so China took a gradual approach. Okay, so. Uh, um, you know, the price reform, the market reform is uh, one of the items that improve the economic efficiency so that you know, China can move closer to the uh, production possibility frontier, okay? Um, and uh, the last 20 years, okay, the accession to WTO, which was like an external device that pushes China to improve efficiency to integrate more with the world, okay, with the rest of the world. Uh, financial reforms, 
you know, housing reform. Okay, housing used to be taken care of by the company that you work for. Okay, uh, so since 1998, you know, the, the commercial residents uh, began to flourish. Okay, and macroeconomic reform. You know, that is, you know, you borrow the policies, um, policy framework uh, from uh, successful models overseas. So in the context of the, uh, the, the World Bank report, you know, if we talk about three pillars, uh, then I can put all those items that I just listed uh, into those three pillars. Okay, so this is what I would try. You know, the outward orientation, okay, so the export-oriented strategy uh, based on the uh, uh, you know, cheap labor, the competitive advantage of uh, cheap labor. And import advanced technologies from overseas Borrow advanced management practices from overseas, import, mimic, and adapt advanced technologies from overseas, borrow business models from overseas. You know, you have YouTube, and then China had uh, a Youku, right? So you have Amazon, China has Taobao, you know, all these uh, different models. Um, and accession to WTO, outward um, orientation. Um, improve human capital, uh, China also did a lot. Okay, besides the uh, emancipation of the mind, which I really emphasize, um, unfortunately, you know, in the past uh, three years, there has been some, uh, you know, going back. Uh, that's something that I wanted to see changed. Okay, back to emancipation of the mind. Um, and improve human capital at a large scale, um, especially since 1999. Okay. Extend the years of compulsive education, there were some cities which have already begun uh, to try. And expand the tertiary education. Okay, so, uh, you know, when I went to college in 1979, the enrollment rate was like 2%, okay? And uh, nowadays it's uh, over 40%. So there was, a, there was a huge improvement in this regard. And the third pillar, okay, sound economic governance. Okay, we have uh, reform on, on the incentive mechanism, Talent village enterprises, okay. um, and tax assignment system. Okay. Uh, you know, competition among local governments, improve law and enforcement, market reform, as I talked about, etc. Okay, so um, these, uh, you know, really uh, improve the soundness of economic governance. Right, but now we are facing changing times and uh, uh, there are lots of new challenges. Um, the trade protectionism and the technology protectionism. Okay, so what is going on nowadays with regard to Huawei, you know, everybody is aware of that. Um, so China needs to do um, or engage you know, in proprietary uh, innovation and also needs to diversify trading partners, okay. uh, push for collaborative development, okay, the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Right. Um, you know, although there are some problems concerning the uh, initiative, okay, there are um, uh, so-called uh, debt sustainability issues in some of the uh, uh, countries along the, the Belt and Road. Okay. Uh, but it's not the reason for a stop for stopping this initiative. It, you know, we just need to do, to do it better and better plan. Income inequality, uh, that is a problem, and it's getting worse. Uh, it was getting worse, but um, uh, now China is trying to do something about it. Okay? Uh, the anti-corruption campaign, okay, so that uh, you know, the, uh, in order to level the playing field okay, and reduce inefficiencies. Uh, financial liberalization, Okay, trying to remove uh, financial repression, which also give rise to uh, rent seeking. And social safety net, okay, so that's also mentioned in the, uh, the World Bank report. Okay. Um, and the other problem is, uh, you know, the development model so far in China over so many years uh, has resulted in, uh, in accumulated debt uh, in China. So there is a need for deleveraging. But uh, the timing is kind of sensitive. Okay? China needs to handle with care. Right? 
um, you know, if the trade war continues, um, you know, the whole the world economy uh, slows down, then it's not a time to worry about deleveraging. Okay? Uh, you probably want to take a gradual approach. Okay? And um, the last point I want to make is, uh, you know, the new development strategy that I would conceive for, for China, okay? which I think is also in, uh, consistent with the, uh, the World Bank report. Okay. Now, continue with inclusive growth. Okay. Uh, that's very important to provide social stability. And continue with technological innovation, okay, no matter how you know, the advanced economies uh, are trying to, to stop, stop uh, China. Um, but I think there should be a, a shift, a shift of emphasis from export of manufacturing goods based on cheap labor to export of professional services and R&D uh, based on cheap human capital. Okay, so after so many years uh, of human capital accumulation, I think China, um, you can already say that China, China has uh, built up you know, cheap human capital. Okay, you, you know, imagine there are seven million of uh, college graduates per year. Um, so in that regard, you know, if, if, uh, if I can speculate on the hot spots under the new development strategy, I would say you know, the development of the greater Bay Area, okay, the Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau, is the next big thing. In fact, I would imagine that uh, in 2040, there will be 95 million population in this region. And together, you know, it will achieve uh, twice the size of New York metropolitan area uh, in terms of GDP. So it's, uh, it's something that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, of course, there are a lot of challenges. You, know, you have to coordinate the policies, coordinate the rules and regulations uh, within the, uh, the three, three uh, areas. And also, uh, given under the new strategy, new development strategy, Wuhan, uh, as the hub of the uh, high-speed rail system and as the uh, uh, number one city on National Talent Index uh, has a great potential. Okay? Because in, the, uh, in a world when, you, uh, when the service sector becomes more important, this kind of face-to-face -face interaction uh, is crucial. And Wuhan as the hub of the uh, high-speed rail system uh, has the advantage. Okay? So if any of you who, uh, who is not familiar with Wuhan, you should take a high-speed train from Hong Kong to Wuhan to visit. All right, I'll stop here. Thank you. Spoken as a true native son of Wuhan. <laughs> OK. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to be brief and cut some of my comments so we can get to the discussion. but. I did want to echo Dan Yang's praise of the report. Uh, so in particular, what I really appreciated about the report was that um, we often fall into the trap in, in terms of thinking about what advice to give developing countries to say, oh, you should just do what Korea did 20 years ago, or what Japan did 30 years ago. And that really misses the point that we live in a very different world than Korea 15 years ago or Japan 20 years ago. And this, really puts the current challenges in a very contemporary context of productivity slowdown, of uh, mature global value chains, but of decline in global growth. And the descriptions of this and how East Asia fits in are really, were very uh, informative for me to have a, uh, a better perspective on the environment that these countries are facing uh, from a global perspective. And of course, there's a lot of talk, especially in the inclusion chapter, about the role of technology and what it means for the future of jobs. And there's a huge public discussion now happening about the future of work uh, everywhere, uh, including uh, in the US, Western countries, China, and other developing countries. And I think the uh, report makes a lot of sensible policy recommendations, uh, which I won't uh, spend further time on. I wanted to just do a few things. I wanted to. Uh, say a few things about this issue of the future of jobs, because um, it's a topic that I've been spending some time doing research on myself. And I want to talk about um, 
what I would call the ele an elephant in the room in terms of the policy recommendations that the report really doesn't talk about industrial policy at all, and it's a huge center of policy debate in China and other places in Asia. And then uh, talk about uh, some implications for Hong Kong. So um, it wasn't described as much in the presentation, but the report talks about the understanding we have now about how technology affects jobs. And it shows that there are some very pessimistic reports, mainly done by engineers that say half of the jobs are going to disappear in the world. And I think as economists, we need to take a very principled, strong stand against that type of alarmist rhetoric because you know, China's adopting robots like crazy, but China's not having an unemployment problem. And uh, I think especially in um, developing countries and emerging markets, there's so many other first order factors affecting employment demand and outcomes that I think it's completely misplaced to start obsessing about robots and AI at this point. Um, and in particular, in addition to technology, which is kind of what the focus is in terms of future of work, in developing countries and emerging markets, globalization, skill, ability of the, of the labor force, and structural change are really huge forces, and often the most important forces. And Andy had put up a figure uh, from research that I had done on China, and we find that in China that you see routine tasks, you know, which are the ones that are supposed to be disappearing, actually increasing in China. And the main reason is, number one, the growth of the service sector in China, where there's a lot of um, retail jobs that are pretty routine um, and that have a big effect on the overall distribution of tasks in the economy. But also, we've done other work that shows globalization is also leading China to specialize in more routine work. In other words, if the routine stuff is being outsourced from the US or Europe, a lot of those uh, tasks and jobs are being insourced into China. And a perfect example would be a Hong Kong firm that sets up a factory in the mainland, and all of the high-end stuff, the strategy, the financing, the, the R&D is done in, in the headquarters in Hong Kong or Singapore or other, somewhere else, but the production is done in China to take advantage of the lower production cost. That kind of uh, pattern is one where you'll have very routine work being done in China and uh, compared to domestic firms that have to do everything in-house in China, right? So this explains part, I think, of the different changes in China. But, I, but a big caveat I want to make in terms of the measurements that Andy presented and that also my own work is that all of those um, measurements about how tasks are changing, uh, skills are changing over time are based on changes in occupational structure. Because we have data from labor force surveys and census on what is the distribution of different occupations. And we make an assumption actually from a US benchmark about what is, what type of tasks are involved in each occupation. But in fact, some other work that we've been done using survey data where we ask every worker what do they do in their job finds that or suggests that within occupations there's huge differences in what individuals actually do. And over time, we know in China, almost within every occupational group, the education of people doing those occupations increased quite a lot. Okay? And that's not captured at all in these measurements. because. It's not capturing this within occupation increase in what people do. In other words, what engineers do today is quite different than what engineers did 10 years ago, even though in the data they're both just classified as the same occupation, so we assume there's no change. And I think, and I've done some work that tries to make an adjustment for this in the Chinese data, and we find it really reverses these trends that actually this type of bias will lead to a really underestimation of the shift to non-routine cognitive tasks, these abstract tasks, and I think that's happening everywhere in China. And at the end of the day, the report really makes the same point, in that we know, although there's a lot of mixed uh, patterns in different countries, at the end of the day, this technology overall in most countries is leading, um, and, and also the structure of demand that people are demanding more high-level services and goods is leading to a greater shift to these more these tasks that require abstract thinking. And I think the punchline then is that it has to, it's very simple actually. It's, it's that we need to really focus on building up human capital so people can deal with any technology and adjust. And maybe not get so focused on thinking about how every specific technology is going to affect which type of workers, low skilled or high skilled. I think it's very complicated.
and hard to prove. And at the end of the day, you just need workers that are going to be dealing with a future where we know average technology is higher, and they need to be able to adjust and react and find where the opportunity is in the shifting kind of global value chain. So there's now more work being done. A lot of variation about how globalization impacts the test. And that, that was not really emphasized in the report. And I told you that in China, this is contributing importantly to the routinization of work in China. But work that looks at this across many countries finds that globalization for rich countries does tend to uh, lead to the elimination of routine jobs. But in middle income and lower and less developed countries, the patterns are very mixed. Some do see more routine work, some see less routine work. It's very complicated depending on what part of the value chain different countries are specializing. And even that kind of specialization is changing quite a bit over time. So for instance, China now, there's data which suggests that China is now, uh, it started at the low part of the value chain, but it's, it's, it's occupying a much greater share of the value chain of products, which means it's now sourcing much more internally, so that China is producing a greater share of the value added of many products. And this creates issues for other countries and how much, what parts of the value chain they're going to be able to jump in and get, especially in developing, other countries in developing East Asia. Okay. So the other big thing I wanted to comment on was industrial policy. So <clears throat> I don't know how many years ago, you know, the World Bank produced this East Asia Miracle Report. And if you read that report, they danced around the issue of industrial policy because they, I know, I heard, that there were, it was too contentious, even within the bank, on what they could say or should say about it. So they basically tried not to say anything about it. And I think this report does the same thing. I think, understandably, it's a very difficult issue to grapple with. But I think it's worth mentioning because I think if you actually look at what governments in the region are trying to do, they're really focused on this. And partly it's because China has had a pretty active industrial policy. China is the center of all these value chains. A lot of countries are looking to what China did, setting up special economic zones. And so I don't think you can escape this in terms of giving good advice. And I kind of wish that the A report, maybe not this report, but A report would take this on a little bit more directly and not necessarily endorse very active industrial policy or no industrial policy, but at least try to think about characteristics of industrial policies that are definitely things you shouldn't do and definitely things you might consider doing and the record and at least the arguments on both sides of the debate and it could be helpful to leaders. Now China has had an approach you know, we've been doing some firm surveys in China and you know China has a, has a system now where they are very much trying to promote uh, uh, industrial upgrading, the shift to more higher technology production they really subsidize high-tech firms, which is an official classification. They provide subsidies for robots and automation. The government often, local governments often cut deals with different firms. Regulations are often very irregular in terms of how different firms are treated. I think a lot of this stuff, if you look at how it's implemented, is not being done in a very efficient way and is very harmful, actually, to efficiency and growth because it often does not allow the most productive firms to attract the most resources and survive. It often tends to benefit incumbents. It leads to some perverse incentives to produce patents just so you can qualify for subsidies rather than actually innovate. I think we, there's a lot of reasons to be suspicious of how productive a lot of the surge in patenting has been in China. I think there's a lot of things to criticize about this approach, at least that's how it's being implemented in China. I know less about other countries. Um, and it would be great to take a stronger stand, maybe, against some aspects of this. Now, there is a lot of discussion, you know, there's public debates in China. Again, Justin Lin is involved, where Justin has consistently advocated for dynamic industrial policy that is forward-looking, that leaders need to see where their country is and what the sectors are that are the next ones that they should be focusing on to get to the next level of development and to be very active in supporting those sectors. But then once they're not the efficient ones to step back, that is very hard to do politically. I think most people, maybe many people at the bank and, in, uh, you know, in, in, in many, and many economists would be very skeptical that the government can, can really play this game in an in a accurate way and that the government should stay back. And we're in Hong Kong, of course, there's a long tradition of the government really stepping back from 
being very active in trying to decide what businesses do, right? And um, but Hong Kong too is getting pressure now. It's being told by, as far as I understand, by by Beijing that you need to be more proactive. You need to have a plan. You need to do something to really spur innovation, and productivity in a way that's going to generate more growth. So it's an issue. Okay, I'm going to skip this and just say a few things about what is the relevance for Hong Kong. Of course, the report is not about Hong Kong, although Hong Kong is East Asia. But I think there's, a, there's certainly a relevance uh, in terms of the thing, because Hong Kong, as a small open economy, really is, depends on kind of the economic activity occurring in the rest of East Asia as a source of business. Um, so some of the lessons of the report, I think, directly have relevance to Hong Kong, and some are kind of indirect, because especially um, the recommendations that service sector trade needs to open, financial infrastructure needs to be, these are, if that happens, it could have really big effects on Hong Kong, right? And Hong Kong has negotiated, for instance, a new trade agreement with ASEAN, and they put in a service sector, I think, component, but they really need to push hard in these areas because those are the aspects of trade integration that will benefit Hong Kong much greater. And those are areas that most countries in the region, as we've seen, are kind of reluctant to open up. So that needs to be a focus of, of policy in terms of how Hong Kong relates with the rest of the region. Other things I wanted to point out. So, this issue of expansion of education. So th there's a figure in the, t in, the, in, the, in the report that shows that Korea is this amazing uh, overachiever in terms of the learning of students. And Korea has really, has many, many universities, and people in Korea claim that college graduates can no longer find jobs, right? At the same time, there's a lot of really, many ways in which Korea is a, is a strong performer, right? And Hong Kong has not has chosen not to dramatically expand higher education. I've seen op-ed pieces in the South China Morning Post where people strongly say we have to reduce college graduates because college graduates can't find high-paying jobs. But I think it's completely wrong. If you think about the future, all of the things talked about in the report, technology, that I think there should be a very significant expansion. Uh, higher education is even something that Hong Kong could be exporting, and it could it could be a center for uh, education, educating not just Hong Kong students, but people in the region, right? Um, and uh, that, for some reason, has not been a direction that the government has chosen to go. Uh, but I think in the long run, it will be very costly. I think the lesson from Korea is that this is actually a good thing, not a bad thing. That I don't think, especially if you think making decisions today is going to affect a generation of people in the labor force, a generation from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, then I think the more the better. And then, um, Dayong talked about the greater Bay Area. There are a lot of issues in Hong Kong about how to integrate with mainland China. I think that greater integration is inevitable. It's certainly being pushed now by the Hong Kong leaders <coughs> in the greater Bay Area. Um, there are a lot of potential synergies given Hong Kong's strength, especially in innovation, because we have great universities, great researchers, great engineers here. And if they can work for, with manufacturers in Shenzhen, et cetera, obviously there's, there's, there's potential benefits here. Um, but it, it requires a view of integration and labor mobility that we, we're not just training, in principle, it would be, we're not just training Hong Kong students to be leaders or professionals just in Hong Kong, but perhaps in, in, in all of China or in all of East Asia. And if there's a broader view of where labor is going to move in the future, then it changes kind of the calculations both of individuals and of, I think, the government in terms of what it's trying to do in education. Right now, Hong Kong students, our graduates at USD, don't, most of them don't want to work anywhere but Hong Kong. But I think as China passed, well, I'm not just saying passed, but as incomes, as they are, continue to grow in China, we're going to reach a point where you know, for a lot of students, it's going to be a much better paying job to go to Shanghai and to other places. And when that happens, you'll see lots more of this movement. Um, so let me stop there. And we will now open up some questions from the floor. Yes. Um, so, yeah, can you just introduce yourself and keep the questions short? Okay.
And let well, me ask the speakers to come up here to the front. Well, thanks very much indeed. Um, thanks for uh, sharing your insights with us. Uh, my name is Andrew Leung. I'm a China uh, strategist. Uh, I would love to qu ask a question on uh, industrial policy, by the way, uh, because uh, back in the mid-80s, I was the, the only deputy director general of industry, and there was the very question I faced in that capacity. But I would uh, rather ask a question more uh, focused uh, on the substance of this World Bank report. Um, now, there's, we've talked about a lot of things, um, uh, all the, the ingredients and so on and so forth, but one area which we haven't talked about is the role of um, physical infrastructure. The role physical infrastructure plays in enhancing productivity uh, or the lack of physical infrastructure in inhibiting the growth of productivity. Now, there is a, a short reference to China's barren row, and you know that uh, high-speed rail is this, um, you know, sort of is, is, the, is the defining kind of feature in China's economy. So my question to you um, on the World Bank report is that have you quantified uh, this, the, uh, the role physical infrastructure plays both nationally within the countries and regionally within the region? Thank you. Let's take a few more questions and then we'll bring it to the speakers. Hi, thank you for your sharing, very insightful. I'm Johnson from Hong Kong Foundation, a policy think tank in Hong Kong, and I study international development. Uh, my question is about the relationship between innovation and openness. So in the report, um, it's mentioned that uh, outward orientation and openness is very important, particularly in the area of service. But at the same time, uh, as Professor Xie has mentioned, like the success of China in developing its technological capacity has relied on um, uh, primarily on uh, mimicking the technologies from abroad and also borrowing business models from other countries. And I think a lot of people would agree that um, China could have uh, Baidu and could have uh, other uh, websites or apps because companies such as Facebook and Google were blocked from the, China, the Chinese market. So it appears that there may be a relationship between or maybe um, selective openness could be beneficial to uh, the development of capacity. So my question is about like, uh, how you uh, see the relationship between openness and the development of technological innovation and particularly the role of industrial policy as well. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, then, no? Okay, uh, then let's bring it back to the speakers. And maybe you can react to whatever you want to answer the questions. Maybe first. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you uh, to uh, both uh, Danyang and Albert for their comments as well as for these questions. So, on the role of inf physical infrastructure, uh, we didn't quantify, and I mean, there's a you know part of the reason was. Uh, we didn't want to write a report on everything. Now, you know, physical infrastructure is something one could write a separate report on. Now, you're right that in many of these countries, and this is where China clearly differs from much of the rest of the region, China's problem is not one of too little physical infrastructure. It's likely of too much infrastructure and how you actually get returns from all of the infrastructure that has been created. Now, having said that, it's clear in some places, you know, and any of you, I mean, most of you have been to Jakarta and Manila and Bangkok, and you can see the, what the lack of physical infrastructure actually looks like. And there are country level estimates, for instance, in Manila, we've done a report on productivity in the Philippines, that makes the case that lack of physical capital is a binding, is one of the constraints on productivity growth in. Uh, the Philippines, and so part of the Philippines agenda is how do you get uh, physical infrastructure going. Now, having said that, the part of it that we do address here is one of the constraints on, a, on the Philippines or Indonesia addressing its infrastructure problem is precisely the fact that they raise too little in revenues. You cannot raise 15% of GDP in revenues and hope to both maintain macro stability 
and invest big time on infrastructure. Now, you could do it if there was some you know, way of attracting private capital, but you know, 25 years into talking about public-private -part partnerships, it hasn't really happened on the kind of scale that this region needs. So, so the way we would turn that around is we would say, yes, there is evidence to indicate that physical infrastructure is an issue that's keeping productivity down. But one of the preconditions for addressing that in countries like the Philippines and Indonesia is you've got to also find ways of, of, of beefing up uh, uh, revenue collection from, you know, you can't be down in the mid-teens and talk about, uh, because at the end of the day, a lot of that physical infrastructure is whether you like it or not, is going to have to be public infrastructure. Now that sort of, let me bring that back to this question of industrial policy, if I might. And, you know, Albert was very perceptive when he said that there was this elephant in the room, and we decided to dance around the elephant. Uh, now part of that is because, again, I think there's a book, or probably many books to be written on industrial policy, it's, and particularly in this region. Now my take on uh, industrial policy is that, and, and the way countries should approach this in, in this region is that it, it goes back to the to another point that I would make, which is I would argue that governments in this region would be much better served if they focused on things like human capital in all of its forms, given the kinds of changes we see, rather than f trying to figure out which subsector of which industry is likely to prosper in the next 10 years. I mean, my own reading of the East Asia, of the early developers in East Asia, is that, it, you know, and, and industrial policy is often, I think, framed as should governments intervene or not. Well, governments intervene all the time. That's not the point. The point is, how should they intervene and how uh, sort of, uh, uh, specific should they be in their interventions. And I honestly, and I've told Justin when this other when he was a colleague, I, I don't think they have the information honestly to be able to conduct the kind of dynamic industrial policy uh, of picking uh, prospective winners ahead of time. I just don't think the evidence supports that. So the other thing I would suggest is there's actually a very nice piece by two colleagues of mine at the World Bank. Unfortunately, we, I just confirmed we didn't cite it in our report because it came out at roughly the same time we were getting ready to publish. It's in the World Bank uh, uh, Research Observer, I think, and it's by Bill Maloney and Gaurav Nayar, which talks, I think it does precisely what you're talking about, uh, Albert, which is it, it tries to kind of think of what do we mean by industrial policy horizontal versus vertical industrial policy. What are the information requirements for each type of policy? And how likely is it that governments in developing countries will have access and will be able to use that successfully? Uh, uh, to okay, let me, let me then uh, pick up on uh, this question about innovation and openness. <clears throat> I think it's a very important question. It's a question that, that gets dealt with in the report uh, a, a little bit and a bit more indirectly than directly. I should mention as a kind of an advertisement that the next uh, deep regional study that uh, that we're doing uh, in, in our office and with other colleagues in the World Bank is pre precisely on, on in innovation. So in a year or 18 months or so, Albert hopefully will invite us back and we'll get to uh, go very deeply into into this question, but but uh, but but look, I think it depends. The issue of openness and in innovation, I, uh, it depends in part on sort of your level of development and where the biggest returns uh, to innovation is, and even by the way, how you define innovation. If you define innovation as as pushing the technological frontier. Uh, which a lot of people do, then that's one form of in innovation. But a lot of innovation can happen in countries, particularly in developing countries, by simply getting I mean, from the inside the productivity frontier to the productivity frontier, which is a, which is a whole other aspect of innovation. It's really about diffusion of existing uh, technology and knowledge, not pushing the, the, the knowledge frontier. Those two things are quite distinct. And different countries at different levels of development 
are better positioned to, uh, to, to, do, to advance in one area or another. So let me, let me be a little more specific about, but, about what I mean by that. At, lo at low levels of development, uh, and this is the part of the innovation story that, come, that comes out directly and somewhat indirectly in our report, the big returns in terms of innovation is knowledge diffusion that comes through FDI and trade. So in that sense and at that level, then openness is the big, is the key to, to innovation because you're absorbing knowledge, you're learning by doing, you're getting access to technologies that uh, would never be uh, produced or invented locally in the absence of uh, engagement with other countries and in, 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 in the world. So, so that's super, super, uh, that's super, super important. Now, in terms at, at higher levels, pushing the frontier uh, becomes more uh, more important. Uh, I, and I take your point about you know how um, selective restrictions on certain technologies, and particularly. Uh, related to internet and related sorts of services have have led to to the growth of own uh, industries in in China. But what's missing there is the counterfactual. Like what would have happened if if uh, China had been open to you know to Facebook and to Google and and to these sorts of companies, maybe they would be riding on the shoulders of those rather than duplicating those. So uh, again, I think. Uh, I, I can't see how uh, how openness is, is. I don't have an empir I don't have empirical evidence because we don't have that counterfactual. But uh, but I think that uh, it's hard to see that openness necessarily would be a problem to the development of the of, of higher level services. Once a country is 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 ready to push the frontier as opposed to just absorb and diffuse existing technologies. There's a very kind of there's a recent World Bank report done by colleagues, including uh, Bill Maloney, uh, who Sudhir just men mentioned, and, uh, and a colleague, Xavier Sivrera, called The Innovation Paradox. And it, goes, it goes very deeply, you can find the report online, it goes very deeply into these issues at the global level. They, they have something called the capabilities escalator, which I think is a very helpful kind of conceptual device. For very low levels of development, they basically argue that what countries should do is build institutions and capacity to absorb technology. At medium levels of development, then openness to trade and gaining through knowledge absorption, tech, uh, tech, technology transfer and diffusion uh, of te te technologies into the private sector uh, is the next level. And then finally, the third level uh, the third level is pushing, pushing the frontier. So depending on the level of development, you know where the gains are going to be uh, is uh, will differ. And, 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 that, and in that sense, just my, my last comment on this would, would bring back to something that Sudhir said in opening up our pre the presentation on the report, which is, you know, China has been this huge development success story in many many ways, and yet their per capita. Uh, income is still just one fifth of the high income country average. So, so it, you know, to expect that they'll necessarily be at the high income country average for technology creation or innovation may be a set of expectations that are not exactly the the correct expectations. They may be punching above their weight uh, in a global sense beyond this one fifth. But uh, but still, you know, there's a there's a challenge ahead. So um, I think I'll just end on that. I don't know if this would be you wanted to. Um, we're a bit past time, but I, since we uh, don't, haven't had enough time for questions, maybe we'll take another round of questions if there are a few. Yeah, back here. But if you need to get running, you will understand. Um, Mark Michelson. I, I do a lot of things, but I also teach a course at uh, CUHJ on government and economy. And what's come up a lot is, is some of, one of the things you mentioned, growing demand on state institutions, on government, and also the challenges of that because at the same time, as you sort of suggested, 
the credibility and the support for governments is often weakening, or not just in Asia, not so much in Asia, but around the world, partly because of openness and so on. So, for example, my, in our case, we've included a, a section on stakeholder engagement as, as part of the course. I just wondered if you wanted to elaborate on, on that particular issue and, and the challenges of actually dealing with that as far as governments, particularly in East Asia. Any other? Oh, yeah, you have a question? Just do the last one and then we'll take it back. Uh, could you explain more about human capital and what you think of that? Yeah. yeah, so look, um, Thank you for both of uh, those questions. And they go in their own way to, to some of the core issues that we raise in, in our report. Um, I, I'm a bit biased because I come, because, uh, I come from a, a human capital economics background. So with that as a, with that as a caveat. But let me, let me say that you know, one, of the, one of the starting points uh, of the, for the East Asian success up until today uh, as, as Sudhir mentioned, uh, and, and is quite well documented in the literature, is, is, the, is the development of basic human capital in, the, in these countries. This enabled people to move from agriculture into basic manufacturing. Uh, there were certain re basic requirements like literacy, basic literacy, and basic numeracy that enabled people to move out of the traditional sectors into the modern sectors. This is extremely well documented. I think what we, what we argue in the report is um, that as times are changing, as countries in this region are develop, uh, developing countries in this, in this region are developing, they're moving up the value chain. Um, and the demands for the basic literacy and numeracy is no longer sufficient to be either productive or competitive in in the labor market, or to contribute to the economy in the way to raise productivity. Then add on that the, this issue of changing technology. Uh, and as technology changes, we anticipate it will change, uh, in, in, change uh, at an increasingly rapid rate into the future. So uh, in that sense, I agree also uh, exactly with Albert's comments, that this is really go going to be the key uh, it's going to be a key to productivity, but it's certainly going to be a key for uh, individuals to participate in the 21st century economy and, uh, and to ensure, so governments in the region will need to ensure that everybody has some kind of, not just basic uh, education, but more access to advanced skills to be able to participate. Just one last point on this. You know, we often talk in the develop, in development circles about giving greater access to education and improving education quality. And both of those things are still really important. But there's a third element that we haven't talked about as much in the past, which I think is going to be increasingly important, which, and, and Sudhir alluded to this, and that's that you can't just tack on development of critical thinking skills or teamwork or socio-emotional skills at the end of high school or tertiary, tertiary, at the level of tertiary education. If you're waiting to that point, it's too late. So it's not just more education and better education, but it's really thinking differently about how to imbue skills. And starting really at the early childhood development stages, uh, and then building step by step on that moving forward. But this is a centerpiece, I think, of the development agenda for, for uh, these countries going forward. So Andy left a really hard question to me, which was the question about governments and governance. Uh, and you know, I feel particularly, well, both of us are economists, so this is, uh, I realize you're imperialists as economists, but this is hard stuff, right? This is about politics and about uh, uh, political science. But, but let me, I mean, the way we approach this in the, in the report is, you know, it would be far too simplistic for us to suggest that there's a single route here. There is obviously, you know, how China addresses these issues is going to be very different than how Indonesia uh, or the Philippines uh, or, or Malaysia handle it. 
But, but, the, but the important point I think we're trying to get at here is that there's a lot of evidence to indicate that the kind of governance, economic governance, these countries emphasized in their early development years was fantastic for that period. But as countries, as economies get more sophisticated, as countries get richer, for a number of political economy reasons, that isn't going to be, it isn't going to be enough to have a small cadre, you know, so it can be the EPD in, uh, in uh, Korea or uh, you know, a small group of advisors to Suharto in Indonesia. So these are the technocrats, right? The Berkeley Mafia in Indonesia, which was fine for that level of development. But as you get more sophisticated, the interest groups get more uh, uh, diverse in society. Coalitions are harder to build. There are winners from that first round of development who are going to be increasingly unlikely to want to give up their gains in the next round, even though it may require measures, policies that actually level the playing field, you know, sort of vested interest. And, and it's in that context, I think, that this point about greater transparency, greater participation and voice, and very importantly, more checks and balances become important. Now, we would end there. I mean, I have, honestly, I don't know how China or uh, Myanmar, for that matter, are going to make that transition. All we're saying is that to, to, as we wrote this report and as we researched this report, and we worked here with, with a political scientist who knows this region well, Eddie Molesky, wrote a background paper for us. It, it, it becomes harder to think of these countries successfully making a transition to high income without finding an institutional way of addressing this. That way will need to be tailored to their circumstances. It will be, it'll be obviously different in a kind of system that you have in Indonesia than it is in some other system. But they will have to figure this out. And the key points there are around greater voice and participation, greater transparency, and more checks and balances. I would just, sorry, just a, no, yeah, no, uh, I, I think this is the fundamental point, but I, I would just add that I think that um, the technology also gives governments in the region, regardless of their uh, of their political system, more tools to uh, if they're if they're prepared to to seek stakeholder input uh, into policy making processes uh, and to enable voice. Uh, and actually, uh, we see, um, you know, through um, through access to information uh, reforms uh, in China and Vietnam and elsewhere that there's more of this being done. But I th whether this is whether these are sufficient sorts of reforms to to enable the kind of voice that will be really important for, for example, breaking policy capture and getting the next generation uh, of reforms, that's uh, still, I think, a pending question. Okay, I'm going to uh, close a minute and thank again our speakers coming from Washington, D.C. to present the report. Thank you for your patience and for coming to our event today.